Hello and thank you for joining me on another foodoffensive.com video broadcast. Uh, I welcome you here because I want to uh, bring about action and awareness to the food uh, that we eat, things that's in our uh, food supply, and just to get the word out about what we're eating and what's good for us, what's not good for us, and, and to bring about some action on what we can do to correct the things that aren't, that aren't good for us. And so as a chef, as a working chef, I uh, have, a, have a great desire to serve the safest and uh, highest quality food that I can. And that's becoming increasingly and increasingly harder to do in this day and age with uh, everything that's going on. And, and we're going to cover um, some of that in this episode, what, what, uh, what we're talking about as far as that goes. So if you're just now joining me for the first time, I'm not going to get into uh, really what a little bit about me or anything like I have been doing in other episodes. But there is an intro video that you can look at on my channel uh, or on the video podcast or whatever your uh, media you're using to see this right now or, or listen to this. Uh, you can listen uh, on uh, iTunes podcast and, and also watch the videos and then uh, on, you, on the YouTube channel and, and through the website foodoffensive.com as well. That's right, this is a food offensive. It's, it's from the front lines of our food supply. And so each week we uh, do some uh, current news, what's going on around us, what's going on in food news. And it's not, uh, not the current uh, chefs and, and, and the celebrity chefs and what they're up to. It's not all about that. There's plenty of uh, shows doing that. There's plenty of shows showing you how to cook. This isn't what, uh, what this is about. This is about the actual ingredients, what is going into the food. And so that's what I want to continue to cover. So each week I will cover some current news and then also go into a special report. Uh, we may in the future split those split the video. It's becoming very long to do both, but... Uh, we're going to continue on and we're going to continue on with uh, the GMO special reports. This is the third one already. The first one was an introduction to GMO foods. Uh, the second one was uh, the first part of corn, GMO corn, and, and what that has in store for us, good and bad, and what, what foods that it's in and just all about it, why it's bad. And we're going to continue on with the second part here and, and try to conclude with, with this and then we'll move on to the next uh, staple crop that's a genetically modified crop that we also eat a lot of. And so, but let's continue with corn tonight uh, as a GMO special report, but let's first look at the current news this week. Now these are uh, some articles from the last couple of weeks and there are several of them. In the last couple of weeks I've just done like two, two articles that I've covered, but I really went into in-depth analysis of them and I've read some quotes from the article and I've also given my own um, perspective to it and some of my own experiences and so forth. Uh, but this week I want to uh, rattle off about six or seven uh, news articles, but uh, I'm not going to go into depth in each one, so I want to just be able to get on with the special report and not to make these uh, videos so long. So the f current news this week, first one, Food Incorporated Director Produces a Right-to-Know GMO Short. And this is an article by uh, Food Freedom. It's uh, foodfreedom.wordpress.com. Um, it's, a, it's a food freedom blog, and they do some their own writing, and they also link to other articles. And uh, this is a right-to-know uh, genetically modified organism short video, a couple minutes long, where they, they interview people about wanting to know, wanting to ha know the labels and see the labeling on food. So... Uh, the Food Incorporated director, of course, if you haven't seen Food Incorporated, uh, it's a documentary. Uh, you can find that on Netflix, and, and it's on DVD, uh, possibly online and other places. But uh, it, for me, it did what it did what Super Size Me did to McDonald's. It did for me to uh, just the food and organics and and what what's what's really coming down the pipe uh, and into our our mouths onto our plates and into our mouths so uh, you can watch that documentary but the director of that the producer of that uh, did a short video and that you can see that um, on their website uh, this is what it says we have a right to know 93 percent of americans want the fda to label genetically engineered foods uh, and you can watch this new video from that uh, filmmaker of food incorporated his name's robert kinner and you can hear why we have the right to know what's in our food and why we should know, uh, I might add. Will you join these individuals and over half a million Americans in contacting the FDA to require the labeling of genetically modified or genetically engineered foods? Tell the FDA to require GMO food labels. You can uh, send them a little 
love letter at uh, consumer at fda.gov uh, or sign the legal petition to the FDA at justlabelit.org. It's justlabelit.org. It's pretty pretty fair and uh, pretty pretty straightforward uh, title uh, and website name. So you can go there to take action and, and really, and we looked at last week a little bit, you really don't know what's in the food. If it's not labeled non-GMO, then you can probably pretty much guarantee that you are eating a genetically modified food of some sort. And we'll look at, uh, in looking at corn tonight, we'll look at why that's uh, so important with corn being in so much of what we eat. So uh, the next article, we're moving right along, like I said, very quickly. Uh, glyphosate in Monsanto Roundup pollutes groundwater supply. That's right, that's from uh, Mercola.com. Now, Monsanto is the world leader in the production of genetically engineered staple crops. And it has long claimed that its broad-spectrum herbicide, Roundup, is safe. In fact, they have even used the following slogans to describe it. This is what they're using to describe uh, Roundup. That's just some of the things they've described it as in the past. Uh, the first one, it's safer than mowing. Also another one, quote, biodegradable. And a third one, quote, environmentally friendly. Well, what we are now finding out is that unfortunately, long after hundreds of millions of pounds of this chemical uh, have already been applied to U.S. soil, it's, it's that Roundup is proving to be a pervasive environmental threat, one that may already be poisoning a good portion of the world's remaining natural water supply. So very, very dangerous there. And you know how important water is to us. So if, if it's going into the ground and, and uh, going into our drinking water, and then we're getting it that way too as well. So very, very dangerous. And then another one. Another article, new scientific study links bee deaths to pesticides. And that's another uh, pesticide-related uh, issue uh, and herbicide-related. Uh, naturalnews.com did that story. Uh, and it's actually uh, on a study by Purdue University. Now, the scientists at Purdue University seem to confirm what environmentalists have long suspected, that the massive bee die-offs, known as colony collapse disorder, are linked to pesticides. And specifically, researchers are pointing to a category of pesticide marketed by the German uh, chemical company Bayer. So, um, of course, you know, bees, uh, when they cross-pollinate in the flowers and they're getting that, that, they're getting that you know, pesticide from the flowers and it's killing them off. And, and their bees are an important uh, aspect to our environment. And so it's very important that, that, the, that those are protected. So that's a study that's out and you can see that at naturalnews.com. Another one, there's a couple of more, a few more articles here. The next couple uh, kind of tie into each other. And that's this one. Uh, the Senate, a senator pushes for GMO labeling in Washington state. And that's another one by uh, naturalnews.com. Uh, and regardless of whether the Republicans or Democrats occupy the White House, you know, it doesn't matter uh, the left, right, which, which side is in there. Uh, the federal regulatory officials continue to disregard concerns about genetically modified organisms, uh, and they stonewall all efforts to mandate proper GMO labeling. And as a result, individual states are having to craft their own GMO labeling legislation, uh, including a new bill which was recently introduced in Washington state. And uh, this bill would mandate GMO labeling beginning in the year 2014. So if we get that going now, and we'll, we'll reap the benefits, or at least the Washington uh, residents uh, in the state of Washington will reap the benefits of that. And of course, we know the part of the reason we looked at last week why the FDA isn't um, regulating the GMO labeling is because well, there's so many ex uh, Monsanto employees and uh, ex associates that are involved in the government now. There's, they have some close ties in the government. Now, Washington State, uh, this is the next article and it ties in with it, of course, uh, Washington State to hold public hearings on GMO food label uh, bills. And that's from Food Freedom Blog. Uh, and that's, uh, this is, I put this one in there, this article, although it's pretty much the same as the other one. This one actually has, uh, it, it actually announces the public hearing dates. And it's Washington State's legislature will hold these public hearings this week uh, on two new bills that would require labeling for genetically engineered uh, raw agricultural commodities and genetically engineered ingredients. 
and that's offered for you know those ingredients that are offered for retail sale so that's going to come up on the 26th and 27th and then also the last one and this is this is an important one if if this could if this could happen it would be absolutely a great step towards um, action against gmo and genetically modified uh, foods and the article is titled why gmo and organic cannot coexist there's a lateral gene transfer that's in that's a food food another free food freedom article and i thought i was going to the the last one here so um this is a different one but it goes on to say that one of the most disturbing though commonly overlooked properties of genetically modified organisms or gmos as we've looked at is their documented ability to transfer genetic information horizontally into those who consume them now this process actually occurs quite commonly in nature especially among uh, bacteria which uh, of course do not re reproduce sexually and therefore have evolved a number of mechanisms through which to transfer genetic information and they do that directly between one another um, directly towards one another now technically speaking horizontal gene transfer also known as lateral gene transfer is the process uh, by which an organism incorporates genetic material from another organism without being the offspring of that organism and then vertical transfer on the other hand occurs when an organism receives genetic material from its ancestor e.g. its parents or a species from which it has evolved so uh, that's kind of a scientific kind of some scientific explanations there but we looked last week in that GMO special uh, about the the different things that they're doing splicing spider genes into goats and things like that and uh, the the pig the pig snouts that are glowing they've actually been able to pass that gene on to their offspring so uh, this is pretty pretty wild and it, it does affect us it and now the, uh, this is from the OSGATA, which uh, stands for uh, the Organic Seed Growers and Trade Association. Now, in a development celebrated by the organic plaintiffs, Judge Naomi uh, Buckwald announced on December 28th that oral arguments on Monsanto's motion to dismiss the Organic Seed Growers and Trade uh, Association, OSGATA, versus Monsanto will be heard in federal district court January 31st, 2012 in Manhattan. Um, now, Judge Buckwald's decision will establish if organic farmers are to see their day in court. The 83 family farms, small and family-owned seed businesses, and agricultural organizations comprising the organic plaintiff group represent over 300,000 individuals. The landmark lawsuit filed in March of uh, 2011 challenges the validity of Monsanto's transgenic or GMO patents and seeks court protection for innocent family farmers who may have become uh, contaminated by Monsanto seed. Now, if you've seen some of um, if you've seen some of the documentaries and things concerning GMO foods, you'll know that farmers have been sued by by Monsanto for using their seed because Monsanto has a patent on it and uh, because it's their creation they've patented it uh, to those just those that buy it from them well these seeds infect uh, through cross-pollination and, and and so on and so forth they they infect the fields of farmers next door to someone that's using the GM crops and then Monsanto tries to come after them and uh, sue them and they pretty much in some cases take all their say you know that these people spend their savings trying to fight Monsanto or they or they take some type of buyout or slap on the wrist and it's it's really sad what they're doing and so that's we'll probably cover that in other uh, GMO um, special reports but right now we're going to go on to, to to tonight's special report and that's that's continuing in the special reports series on GMO foods or genetically modified foods ge genetically modified organisms and it's it's corn part two we covered corn last week but this is going to be part two so moving right along we're going to look at some of the health risks uh, some of the published studies and the products that corn is in so of course what is GMO we've looked at it the last couple of weeks it stands for genetically modified organism and also can be seen as genetically engineered organism GEO and it's an organism uh, whose genetic material has been altered using genetic engineering techniques 
so they they you know whether they splice uh, insect insecticide inside of it to in order to produce uh, produce insecticide and and um, to keep pests away and keep from destroying the crop or to become resistant from herbicides that they use which would require sometimes the farmers uh, you know using more herbicide because the weeds have res- built up a response to it and, and built up an immunity to it and then that insecticide and, and herbicide gets of course passed down onto us to the food so now from the Institute of uh, Res- for Responsible Technology uh, responsibletechnology.org they have an article that on there that says GMOs are not safe um, of course GM foods are not properly tested for human safety uh, although human studies are not conducted Adverse findings in animal studies have prompted the American uh, Academy of Environmental Medicine to call for an immediate moratorium on GMOs or just stop using them until we can figure out what it is that's that are they good or are they bad? Let's stop using them. That's basically what they want to do to stop using them until they can decide is this right or wrong. So uh, and they cite many problems with reproduction, immunity, digestion, aging, insulin, and cholesterol regulation and of course organ function we looked at an article a couple weeks back about uh, it being linked to organ failure so in the mice that they used it on the rats that they used to test it and the following is a selection of studies showing health effects and uh, these are these are corn specific of course because we're doing uh, we're reviewing the corn specifically this week Um, but one of them is rats that were fed BT corn they grew slower they suffered liver, liver and kidney problems and had higher blood levels of certain fats. And then also rats that were fed BT corn over three generations suffered liver and kidney damage and altered uh, in, they were altered in blood chemistry. And then also a third one, uh, mice fed BT corn showed disturbances in the immune system cell populations and uh, the bio, its biochemical activity. And uh, another one, mice fed BT corn over four generations showed progressive abnormal changes in the liver, spleen, and pancreas. So uh, those are major changes in the pattern of the gene function in the gut, and uh, which affects, for example, you know, cholesterol production, protein production, and, and the breakdown, and of course, reduced fertility. And then sheep there was also a study on uh, sheep that were fed the BT corn and they were they did that over three generations as well and it, it showed disturbances in the functioning of digestive system of uh, the offspring and in the liver and pancreas of their lambs um, now I had to look because I know that you know you probably have this question in your mind why do they use mice and how does that really relate to humans how can we know for sure that you know humans uh, are affected as, as the same as these the mice and animals that they use. Well, well, uh, UC Davis has a on their site. They have a little thing that say why why mice? Why are mice used in studies? Basically, is what they go over. So, uh, from their site, it says among the animals used in research, teaching, and testing, mice comprise a majority of all experimental mammals. Um, the remarkable genetic similarity of of mice to humans combined with their you know great convenience and perhaps accounts for you know mice so often being the experimental model of choice in research and of course mice uh, they have their short their short lifespan and their rapid reproduction rate make it possible to study disease uh, processes in many individuals throughout their life cycle so that's how they can tell um, when they when they s- study when they study these mice and they say well the Within three generations, the mice are infertile. That's how they can do that, and they, you know, they can do it much. You know, of course, our lifespan is longer, but in the mice, that they have a quicker lifespan and a shorter lifespan. That they can, they can test the effects over long periods of time and long cycles of of them re- reproducing, and so that gives us a very accurate idea of of what. Um, of what we're dealing with with GMOs and, and not to go off on a tangent here but you know you think well I've been eating it for a long time what's wrong well how many people do you know that are infertile that can't have children how many people do you know that that uh you know they they have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on infertility treatments because they want a kid so bad and they can't have one um, 
I know several people both in the past and present that that have had that problem and spending thousands and thousands of dollars and we think oh it's not a big deal well well let's look at some of the results that we have right now we're living we're living test animals you know we're living we're living uh, experiments right now with this stuff and and we're reaping the benefit you know we're we're seeing the results of that the wages of that so when we talk about corn why is it one of the first one you know why is it the first main crop item that I covered in this GMO series is because you know the corn is in so much of course corn syrup and high fructose corn syrup is is in all you know is in all kinds of items and we're going to have a whole special on high fructose corn syrup because I really been studying that for quite some time and um, chosen to cut that out of my diet uh, as, as much as I can and we want to go over that next because that's a huge one too so so I don't want to get into that too much but uh, there's there's a couple sites I came across when talking about uh, the products that food is in or that products that corn is in the food that that corn is in uh, from OntarioCorn.org and also CornAllergens.com and they put a very lengthy list of uh, of these items together and they have a question on there say there's ten thousand items in a typical grocery store and this is the question they pose how many would you guess would contain corn in one form or another. Well, their answer is 2,500 items use corn in some form during the production or processing. So that's huge, uh, comparatively speaking, to what we eat and how, how much of the percentage is in there. And this is going to be, uh, you're going to see a whole list of these corn allergens scroll through your screen here. So take a look at them. There's, there's so many of them, and you can, you can just point out and see which ones that you eat, and you can tell them right away. So take a look at this list right now. Now, as you can see, that was quite an exhaustive list, and there's almost 200 there, so I wasn't about to rattle those off, but you could you could read them in the screen, and it went by very fast, but you can see a little bit of, of what they're in. Now, that particular list was from the cornallergens.com, and of course, that's for people you know that have an allergy to corn, and I heard of someone locally here that, um, that was allergic to corn, and I was thinking to myself, how can they eat anything? I mean, really, they're just, it's, it's absolutely insane, and... Uh, Great for the farmers, and, and I want to support farmers, don't get me wrong, but um, we can grow corn that's not genetically modified, and that's my desire. But um, now you can, let, you can let others know why you buy non-GMO. Um, this is a way that we can change this. Consumers are at the top of the food chain. Each time you and your friends spend you know, your hard-earned money, on non-GMO food brands, you add your voice to the growing concern of over 87 million Americans about the safety of genetically engineered foods in the marketplace. 
that's from responsibletechnology.org. And of course, the 87 million Americans, that's, that's how many they estimate want to see a, a labeling of, of GMO foods. They want to see it on their label because they say that, that uh, the majority of people, more than half of the people that have, that have been polled said that if it was labeled GMO, they saw that on the package, that it did contain it, uh, that it did contain GMO, they would not get it. And what we do is we vote with our dollars by doing that because the products, the manufacturers are going to, they're going to cater to us because they know that the sales are where the you know where where the people are buying the food. They're going to just they're going to market to that people and so and that people group. And so, if you if you vote with your dollars, vote with your dollars, and just think about ten years ago, it was so hard to get organic foods, and it was hard to. Um, you know, you had to spend, it, it's still expensive, I understand that, but it was really expensive if you could find anything. And depending on where you live, some areas, of course, are, are easier, but think about that. And now they're everywhere. They're, you've got a Whole Foods popping up uh, everywhere, at least in, in the metropolitan areas. And, and even mainline grocery stores and, and little town grocery stores have organic items. They, you know, they're getting out there. So if you vote with your dollars, this is how we we, we are ch- going to change our food supply, and, and that's my desire with, with doing this weekly update and weekly uh, broadcast through different mediums, different formats. That's my desire is to get the word out. And uh, maybe you've heard some of this before, but maybe this is, you know, that maybe someone that, that you know uh, doesn't know, and this is, you know, they would particularly listen to me or listen to someone else, and you can pass that along, that information along. And um, I spend a lot of time each week going over these things. It's very important to me. Uh, in in protecting my family first and foremost and then as a chef serving the food and and knowing what I'm serving and not just doing it because it looks good or tastes good but also because it's good for you and and wholesome and that's uh, my desire to to be able to inform the public and uh, tell people about what's going on in the food supply and what what what's going actually inside of our bodies and and just aside just uh, within the corn kernels off the chart so and, that and many insects other dise- uh, diseases and things go off the chart and we're just doctoring them uh, with more medicines and more drugs and when we could it could start at our food and really help uh, change our our health and it, just by changing what we eat so to in conclusion here uh, thank you for joining me tonight. The podcast is is up on iTunes. I'm still trying to work on a, a graphic, a better graphic for that, and and that looks good on your mobile device. But it's a good way to to get the audio and listen to it while you're driving, or uh, you can also get the videos and and pass them along to people that way, and um, and also just uh, liking us on Facebook and uh, becoming a fan of our page and and sharing our videos uh, on your own Facebook wall and. I really appreciate those that have done that, those that have subscribed to the YouTube channel and the views uh, that we have. We're, we're, we're getting up there in views, and that's great because it means somebody's watching. And I was looking at the analytics uh, the other day, and there's a lot of people in Texas that love me. So it looks like a lot of the views are from Texas, so I appreciate that. And uh, it's, it's just great to see people actually watching it and, and people all over the world. There's, there's several countries on there that, you know, Italy and Japan, and of course we have ties in some of those countries. So it just comes from people we know, but also, uh, it's just getting out there through, through various formats. And, and I really, I'm really grateful for that because my whole desire here is just to get the word out and, uh, to, to really, um, like I said, first protect my family and I'm already doing the research, so I might as well pass the information along to you. So I hope you are taking it to heart as well. And, uh, looking at the website food, foodoffensive.com we try to i try to post some articles whether they're going to be featured in the uh the videos or not i still try to post them on there and some that are some are not and um and then we're going to try to do a documents and source section but if you're watching this video on youtube of course you can see below in the info section i have all the links i've tried to cover everything that i everything that i post on the video everything that you see on the screen all the articles all the links are right there so there's um, there's no way that you can say this this didn't happen. You can look at those things, and, and, and if anyone questions you, you can say this is the article, this is the study that was done. And so it's very important to get that across. So also if you have something you want to see covered, you can uh, or if you want to be on the show or know someone that, can, that wants to be interviewed, it's in a particular industry or something that they do that's related to this, uh, you can do show tips at foodoffensive.com or our regular email at foodoffensive at gmail.com. So... Thanks for joining me again on another week. I hope that uh, you have been informed. And uh, this is 
has been a foodoffensive.com video broadcast coming at you from the front lines of our food supply. Thank you for joining me.